Okay, well, thank you very much for the invite. Um, I suppose you could sort of sum up our talk is, now you've got some lecture captures, what are you going to do with them? Okay, um, and we'll tell you a little bit about what we were doing in chemistry um, over the last few years. One of the things that we really noticed is that the way that people consume knowledge now is just completely different. I mean, anybody who's got kids will tell you that kids don't sort of pick up books and re go through reference materials. They're just going to look at screens and things like that. Students want to have constant engagement with information wherever and whenever they want to consume it. They want to be engaged by it as well. So it's got to be interesting. How many people sort of hear, oh, I want a session that's going to be interesting? And they also want a lot of feedback on their work. And I think that's really important side of, of thinking about lecture capture and thinking about how you're using these different pedagogical tools is to sort of build in more feedback so the students can improve. Because only through feedback can they actually improve. And academics of these poor souls, and I'm an academic, um, who are expected to create all these wonderful interactive resources. And how are you going to do it with the sort of time that you've got? Well. Unfortunately, what we're used to doing as academic is giving lots of lectures, and we like to give the lectures, and the students sort of sit there, sort of taking all this information in, and then we expect them to take that information away and do some active learning and really start to understand the subject. But that's going on outside of the classroom. This is the real traditional way in which we expect learning to happen. The reality of it is, I would say, something quite different. The students just sort of turn up and then just sort of sit there in a lecture. Many times nowadays, you won't see anybody even trying to attempt to take any notes. Um, few students will actually engage in much activity sort of afterwards. Their time will not be used very effectively. Maybe they're just watching hours and hours of repeat lecture captures. Okay? And the students are sometimes just using this sort of catch-up um, for lecture captures and the lecture recordings. So if they're missing anything or things like that, or they're mi not missing a whole session, missing a part of it, they're sort of trying to capture things up using lecture capture. The problem for us is that this is not really engaging the students in actually any active learning. And this is one of the things, sort of the introduction of lecture capture and active learning are two things that have really come together in chemistry over the last few years. So what we're looking to do quite a lot of the time is to flip our learning so that in the classroom, the students are actually actively engaged in activities, and that's facilitated by the instructor. And the sort of passive learning, the bit of reading or the recording that they can interact with is done outside of the classroom. So we're using that classroom activity really effectively. The concerns about doing this sort of thing is, are the students going to engage with the material that you're providing for them okay, before the session? You're never quite sure whether they're going to turn up unprepared to class. Will this lead to a massive increase in student workload? Now you're expecting the students to do this work outside of the class. They have to do that, really, if they're going to get anything out of the, the active learning class that they're going to turn up to. And they'll have to turn up to the active learning class as well. And also, from an academic's point of view, everybody's worried, how long is it going to take me to create all of this information, these wonderful, engaging little videos and things like that, which the students are going to interact with before they come to my active learning session, which I'm also going to have to prepare. Uh, however, if we look at it from a sort of a how students study, this sort of flip learning would really sort of start to engage the students a bit more. They're going to use time outside of the lectures to sort of passively learn from resources that we're going to provide. And then they're going to do this active learning actually in the sessions, where it's facilitated by an instructor, somebody who has real sort of subject knowledge. So the kind of active learning that we've been really interested in is this thing called team-based learning. And it provides really a fantastic framework in which you can run classes. So before the class, there's a certain amount of preparation. Sometimes that could be lectures, but these could be alternative things like screencasts and pre-reading, e-learning resources that are provided for the students before the session. Then when they come into the session, we do this court thing called a readiness assurance process. So they do um, an individual uh, multiple choice questions, so they do those alone and in silence, and then they sit together in teams, and we've constructed those teams in a very specific way, okay, and they do those multiple choice questions again and come to a teamed consensus about what the answers are, and the answers are going to be revealed by some scratch cards to tell you whether you got the answer right, the little star means that you got the right to right, and then finally, 
we're able as instructors to have an engagement in some corrective instruction. So where people are getting answers wrong, we can in explain to them where they're getting it wrong and sort of show them what the right answers were. And maybe sort of get rid of some of those common misconceptions. All of this is building up to something which we call application activities, where students are actually really solving complex problems. Okay? And these problems are going to lead to debate and discussion within the session. And they're going to be doing that within their teams. So part of the readiness assurance process is actually about getting the teams ready to do these application activities, to do the real difficult problem solving. Now, if you sort of still doesn't quite make some sense, we thought we'd have a go at you going to do a little bit of this readiness assurance process. But the slight problem with doing this is we haven't given you any pre-class preparation. So what we've done is we've come up with three multiple choice questions. So I'll show them in a second. You all, I want you to all, as individuals, have a quick think about what the answers are. Jot your answers down, A, B, C, or D. And then when I say go, then you can start to discuss them in your teams. But don't discuss them with your neighbours before you actually see the questions and have answered them for yourself. So here goes. Oh, sorry. Ah, there we go. So if you've been listening this morning, some of this is actually already answered, especially in question two. And question, and question one, actually. But I don't think the answer to question one was correct. OK, you're happy you've got an answer now? OK, so now in your team, so in your tables or in your groups at the back, have a discussion of the answers, OK? Come up with a consensus for the table, and then use the scratch cards on the table to reveal the answer that you think is correct. So have a quick discussion. another minute. So if you not scratch anything off now, you're going to run out of time. Yeah, you keep on scratching off until you get the right answer. Had it go? Okay, so we got one. Yeah, get a star. Yeah, just keep on scratching until you can get one off, get it right. Okay. 
I think we're going to bring you back together again. It's, it, it's, as you can see, it's one of these things that actually is quite good because it generates a, quite a lot of discussion in the classroom. The thing we, we also think is quite powerful about it, oh, we see, look, there's the team going, yes, yes, we got it. We saw that little star. We're right. Okay. But this is the sort of thing, if you want to get your students working in teams, this is great for it. But also, it's quite... So what was it? Sorry. Uh, it's, it's quite one of those sort of um, ways of, of getting all the, sort of, all the team members working together. And uh, you can, as an instructor, all the answers are out there. So you're not having to go around sort of constantly telling everybody the answers. OK, so how have we used our lecture captures in this? Well, we did a pilot study. What we did is we took our lecture captures and we wanted to convert them. So it was a second semester module. We normally had lectures and problem classes. We replaced it with three two-hour TBL sessions. The cohort already had lots of experience with team-based learning, so they've been doing that for about six months already. And um, what we did is we took the previous year's lecture captures and we cut them up into mini lecture highlights, which lasted 10 to 20 minutes long. Um, I was the editor. It was very light touch editing. I didn't take any coughs out and this sort of stuff. And I should explain, actually, Laura was the person who did originally give them the lectures. We also had these various sections where Laura would go through a problem, and we just left those in, even with the sort of timings that Laura had left in with the lectures. We, didn't sort of, we could say pause here or things like that. There was very few little areas where I had to sort of put in extra material myself. The one bit where I did have to is where the session had stopped. In, it was a two-hour session, and that five-two to five-pass session had stopped, so I had to record that little bit. What were the students' perceptions? Well, they, did inter they, they said that they interacted with the sessions beforehand, so that was quite good. So they were looking at those resources. They found it relatively easy to follow these um, edited screencasts. They were not difficult to follow. Um, they were able to create this comprehensive set of notes. This is something that scientists have a real problem. We always, we always want our students to have comprehensive notes. Um, so them saying that felt good. Um, their understanding of the online material was improved by the TBL sessions. And we think that's the sort of real sort of power of it, in that we're actually getting the students to, to actively work their brains in these sort of situations. Um, you can do lots of things around TBL and having a look at um, sort of their IRAT score and the TRAT scores and things like that. What's slightly more interesting is having a look at how they actually did in their individual um, tests. Um, and what we were saying is that we, we brought them all in and we went through and we looked to see how prepared they were for the session. And as you can see, as the three sessions go on, they're getting more and more unprepared, as it seemed. Prepared was considered to have a 50% or more on the IRAT. Um, what we think really happened is that the material is increasing in difficulty as you go through those sessions, and it's also increasing in novelty. So the first sort of stuff, they, it was sort of some of it was half of stuff they already knew already. It was revision, whereas by the end, it was really quite novel stuff that they were slightly struggling with more. OK, and then finally, um, we did have a look at student performance, looking at how the students performed in the exams before and afterwards. The aromatic chemistry was the one that we introduced this in, and then underneath there, the overall module marks. It's not made much difference, OK, but it, 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 at least it's not had a, a detrimental effect on the students, a, a slight positive one. It's not an easy topic or module for the students to sort of really get hold of. It's not, this is not a perfect comparison because the exam format has also changed during this period, as always these things do. The performance is consistent with traditional teaching is about as best we can say. As far as we go, as tutors go, we thought it was a great success. It was very quick and easy to edit the lecture recordings. Um, they're not going to be perfect, uh, but students are happy with imperfect. They cover the students a bit more slowly than screencasts. So when we, we, what we call a screencast is when somebody sits down, an individual lecturer sits down and records their own material already. That tends to go quite fast, whereas lectures are much slower generally. Um, the students didn't complain about the lack of lectures. Um, there's mixed levels of student preparation for sessions. We believe out of doing these activities, we're creating more independent learnings. And we're actually still doing this all the years on since we actually first introduced this. But as I say, this was a pilot study. And now Laura is going to tell you a bit more about the things that we're doing. OK, so just to one, yeah. 
Um, so we thought that this was a really good thing, so we thought we'd try and extend the project. And the other motivation for us thinking about this project and introducing this type of thing more widely across our degree course um, was that in the 2017-18 academic year, we had the arrival of um, about 20 students from China who were on our um, articulated degree programme, so where they study three years in China and then come over to Kiel for their final year. Um, so this was going to comprise about 25% of the cohort, and this was obviously going to change the dynamic of the class quite a lot. And also they had uh, had a completely different experience up to that point than our, our home students because they'd been taught either via distance learning modules or via these very kind of compressed modules when members of staff went over to China. So our motivation was kind of to find ways to minimise differences in prior learning experiences. Um, and so we thought we'd create a range of these, what we're calling lecture highlights, so these edited lecture capture, um, on kind of across almost all of our second year material, um, but really focusing on things that specifically linked to third year topics. So chemistry is a spiral curriculum, you need to know second year chemistry in order to be successful in, in third year chemistry. Um, so we're really kind of focusing on those topics. Um, this obviously was a huge amount of work. Graham was talking about editing five hours of lectures. We're talking probably, you know, in excess of 100 hours lectures here. Um, and we were lucky to um, secure some funding from the Kiel Innovation uh, teaching Innovation Fund, and so we actually had students editing these resources, okay? Um, so they were given the lecture capture and they had to create the lecture highlights. So as part of using this, we were thinking, well, this could be quite versatile, how are we going to use this? Graham's obviously described one method um, in which it could be used as flipped learning material. Um, but we actually were thinking in this case about using them more as revision for the third year topics because obviously we're, we're doing this for the second year topics so it's kind of feeding into third year um, and so we, we created these and then put links on the appropriate third year VLE pages to these, these second year topics and um, these weren't just provided for the Chinese students they were provided for all students. Uh, but I also use these as in a very similar way to Graham had done for a third year uh, TBL class. And I should say that not all of the resources for the flip learning were these lecture highlights because unfortunately there wasn't lecture capture the previous year for um, a lot of this stuff. So I had to create my own screencast as well. So just to... Um, give you an idea of how we made these. The other thing we did, again motivated by the fact that we were had this kind of quite large amount of Chinese students, um, was that we added subtitles to all of the lecture highlights. Um, and again, we were able to do this because we had student editors. I don't think any of us would have had time to do that. Um, and that, but actually, it kind of um, you know has a wider um, you know, kind of market than just the international students so yeah, this is really good for, for students with hearing impairments um, it also allows students to you know watch these where maybe sound they can't have the sound on um, which you'll see we're coming to the evaluation later so all of them that were created in this period have got these subtitles on I think the students ended up having to actually type out a lot of this because the voice to text software they were using didn't really work very well so that was took quite a lot of their time I think the other thing that we had is that we had a summary of what the 10 minutes um, was on at the start. Um, so the students put in all these slides, they came up with the summary themselves. And the thing that they also did, uh, which was completely their idea, and nothing, nothing to do with us, is that they put this, you shall, uh, should now be able to slide at the end. So uh, each of the highlights had this at the end. And, and the students did all this themselves. Obviously we were checking it, but it was their idea. And I think actually how they've edited them, it's given it quite a good kind of student aspect to um, the resources. So just to kind of link it into what, was, what Graham said, the, my TBL workshops, again, it was involved in enhancing active learning. Again, not very many of them didn't watch the resources before. Um, so the, the red is kind of disagreeing and the kind of greens and blues are agreeing. This was a slightly different project to what Graham was doing because um, a lot of this was based on more kind of qualitative data, but there is a bit of quantitative. Um, so again, the, the sessions allowed them to build their knowledge they'd gained watching the uh, pre-session screencasts. Um, the TBL sessions made them feel responsible for their own learning, which is really important. Um, as I said, this was more of a, a qualitative research study, also part of the uh, Kiel MA in education that Steve was talking about earlier. 
Um, so I analysed a lot of this qualitative data using thematic analysis. Um, so I came out with, with these themes and you know, it was quite a big project. But related to the kind of things we're talking about today, um, I've just included um, some, some student quotes about, um, about various things that kind of pertain to what we're talking about. Um, so they like the fact that TBL enables them to learn it before the class. They feel that they can participate more. They're more engaged. It helps them understand better. Um, they commented on the specific topic. They thought it would be very difficult to learn via lectures. It's very problem solving. Um, they, they were kind of alluding to the fact that if they'd had lectures as well, they would have been less likely to watch the screencast. So they kind of used the word screencasts for, for all of these resources, the lecture highlights um, and the ones I'd made. Um, they were very specific that it forced them to do the work before the session, having these TBL sessions. However, a lot of them said that they missed lectures. Okay, so Graham didn't find that. I'm not sure whether it's because I had third year students and he had first year students. Um, they missed lectures, they wanted lectures as well. They loved the TBL, but they wanted the lectures as well. And they actually came up with something which I thought was really interesting. So Graham was talking about the students, uh, they're doing their passive learning at home, so we can facilitate active learning. But actually, they said watching the screencast was passive. They wanted to have a more active experience, so more, more worked problems, more things to do alongside. So that's really interesting. And those things have fed into how I've changed this, um, changed this for the future. Okay, so in terms of the subtitles, we did, uh, so Daniela Plano, who is the other author on this, who isn't here today, she's still in Spain enjoying a Spanish Christmas, um, but she did a, a wider project on the actual, the use of the lecture highlights as revision resources and, and associated things. So in terms of what the students thought about the subtitles, it was actually quite interesting because obviously we'd done it originally for the Chinese students, but actually the, the kind of the home students really appreciated these as well. Um, and like I said earlier, they were talking about things like, you know, if I can't hear it or it saves me replaying it, if I can't quite, you know, hear what the lecturer is saying. I was using them in the library. I couldn't have the volume on because obviously it was expected to be too quiet. Um, clear understanding of the terminology. So maybe they didn't understand one specific bit of terminology, but having the subtitles there um, really helped that. Um, so they were clearly very appreciated. Um, what they actually used these lecture highlights for, remembering that they were given access to kind of a whole suite of them. Um, so most of them um, seemed, well, the most common thing was revision for exams. And also coursework appeared quite highly. Um, so they were using these for third year coursework that maybe relied on some knowledge from second year. So bringing that back. Um, I'm presuming these pre-session activities are referring to my specific um, course, but that was a very kind of small part of third year. And also some clarification after the lectures on, on various bits. And that's, that's been split down into um, the, the NXU cohort, which is the, the Chinese students and the, the Kiel students. Um, and you can see that for some of them, for example, the coursework, the Chinese students have used these a lot more. And maybe that relates to how they were taught the topic in the first place. Maybe they didn't have as much clarification. The general perception of these is that they really liked them because they were the key information about the lecture, but they were shortened down. I think I was said earlier about having that summary is really good rather than having the whole thing to try and find what you want. Um, so yeah, they can find the information more easily. They're quick for finding something. They think more people should do them. One problem that we did have is that we clearly didn't communicate well enough to the students that these existed because a lot of them said, oh yeah, we thought these were brilliant. Where were they? Um, so they knew that they were available for my stuff because I directed them to it because it was pre-session activities, um, but they weren't available. It was, weren't, sorry, weren't, um, they didn't know it was available for the, for the other things. So again, we need to communicate better with that. As a kind of a final um, point, they were actually asked in general how useful they felt learning resources were. Um, and overwhelmingly, they think that lectures are the best, um, which comes back to what I found when I did my um, qualitative analysis was that they, they want lectures, they, they like it, but they, lectures are like this crux that the students think that they should have. Um, so yeah. Um, they, they do think TBL is really useful. You can see that TBL is ranking very highly, as is lecture capture and screencasts. 
Um, I think that the lecture highlights are ranking slightly lower because maybe they didn't know that it existed, so the lecture highlights are our edited lecture capture. Um, yeah, some of them not really using textbooks a whole lot, um, which we, we know, don't we? Um, so to sum up, you can edit lecture captures. They require less time than creating standalone screencasts. Um, adding subtitles to them really increases accessibility. Um, and they can be used to effectively flip teaching. So I think there's, you know, literature, it's not appropriate to flip teaching by telling students to go off and watch an hour's lecture. Okay, but, the, you know, you can edit them fairly quickly to, to do that if you want to. Um, we're very uh, kind of passionate about team-based learning as an active learning strategy. We haven't really talked too much about team-based learning today, um, but we do promote it very heavily because we do really believe in it. However, You've got to consider your flipped material more than you're just providing content to them. Students, they, they want to be more engaged with flipped material. Okay, so adding some work problems. What I do now is I actually have work problems and then I do work problem uh, answers, um, which they can look at after they've had a go at the problem uh, for the pre-session material. They place incredibly high value on lectures. Um, and I'm not suggesting that we, we stop giving lectures, but I think half, a, half the time it's kind of traditional, that's what they know. Their preparedness varies, that's not a big, big news, is it? Um, so yes, thank you very much. I'd like to thank all these people who were very uh, instrumental in this project. And yeah, thanks for listening.